the in the average proposal uh, especially in a business setting you will want to identify the size of the opportunity quite early this enables senior management to be able to decide whether this fits their appetite at the time or is something they will want to put aside for much later and because remember every single person who picks up the document is thinking how how does this matter to me what's the value that you know this person is uh, you know, presenting so giving a size of the opportunity much early uh, or much earlier in the presentation is usually a good idea um and of course you know you typically find some metrics some numbers that sort of boil down the entire story to facts and figures right uh, and this is a really important point because even if your presentation or proposal isn't necessarily a how do i put it isn't necessarily a new business idea you always want to have at the back of your mind that your communication must be must have facts and figures it must be quantitative right and i think that's something a lot of us skip when we either speak or write you know or communicate in in any of the formats that we do we tend to be very qualitative but very rarely quantitative and um, so you will typically hear someone say things like oh it's a very large market or you will hear things like oh it's a very profitable opportunity but how much so so when you write you always want to keep at the back of your mind that that quantitative aspect must always be a component of what you're speaking about is it a 20% profit margin or is it a 60% profit margin? If the market is, is large and it's growing, at what rate is it growing? Is there a way to sort of ballpark this figure so that everybody gets a sense of, you know, how attractive it is or isn't? Um, now, of course, another aspect to each of the presentations you want to put together would typically be the competitive dynamics. And... I want you to pay attention to these components because even though they have been drafted the way they are in this document, you will always find analogs to anything else you're trying to put together, right? It may not be competitive dynamics in a market sense, but maybe in a document where you're trying to propose a new idea for how to what, um, let's see, let's, let's assume it's a school and you're putting together a proposal on a new way to sort of arrange, you know, um, the students in class or how to organize the curriculum and all of that. There may be alternatives to what you are presenting. Those alternatives will basically fit into the bucket of the competitive dynamics. So this is exactly what you're trying to do. While you have presented the size of the opportunity, you know, what exactly are we getting from this? And you've been able to put together some numbers that identify in very clear terms what the opportunity is. You also want to outline the alternative so that everybody who is thinking about this can compare it to something else and say, look, this is really even better than doing A or B or C. And then, of course, typically you want to include risks and mitigants and then, of course, next steps. Um, looking at it from the lens of audience, um, you also want to always tailor your communication to the kind of audience that you're speaking to. It's an internal audience there's usually a little bit more leeway to speak in jargon because almost everybody knows what you're talking about so if you're talking for example about an mto or you're talking about an m a or you're talking about um a pmi things like this will typically mean one thing to a certain set of people and maybe something else to a different set. speaking to an internal team it's very likely they know what you're speaking about so the more external your communication is the less likely you will have room to speak in jargon it's always very good to lay out those specific terms define them you know in some part of the document so that whoever is reading this can very easily dive into this um if you've worked with a large corporate before you'll always find that if, when you receive presentations from marketing units it's always the most frustrating thing to read they tend to have the highest number of abbreviations and you know terms that they use especially for you know communicating with their own vendors so you will see things like ooh and the likes and you will you'll find it even difficult in some instances to find the meanings of these things even by googling you tend to have to ask them what this is um so it's good to always define these terms very clearly in the document if you know that it's going out to an external audience. If it's internal, you have a little bit of wiggle room. I would advise you define it because you never know where the document is going. But 
Uh, that's just from the lens of audience. In terms of tune, you always want to be positive, you want to be succinct, you want to be concrete, and you want to motivate to action. So what that means is, um, anyway, we'll, we'll get into a bit of uh, examples around this, but my point is, keep that at the back of your mind. Whatever you're saying should be positive, should be succinct, short, as short and as brief as possible. It should be concrete, meaning we know exactly what you're talking about and there's no room for ambiguity. And what it is to actually should leave us wondering what next. It should instead tell us exactly who needs to do what immediately. Um, and then in terms of alignment, you know, what the mistake a lot of um, beginners make when they develop documents, like Google of any kind or any kind of communication, is they tend to want to do it alone and then get feedback, feedback at the end. It's a terrible idea. You want to always build in feedback into what you're preparing. So the example could be that you know your manager has called you to put together a proposal on how to effectively cut down costs in logistics at the company. And you've started to work with the supply chain manager and the finance team and all the others you know you've started to get some sense of how to go about this but then you forget to go back to the person who has given you the assignment to show him where you are at each point in time and then you're waiting until you've put together the whole 50 page document before you walk him through it it's a disaster waiting to happen because people tend to fight ideas that are not theirs but they will most likely align with you when they feel as if they co-created the solution with you. So the approach to do this would be to say, okay, um, you've just sent me a brief to put together a proposal on how to cut down logistics costs by X percent. I want to understand you know, what, what the exact scope is. Are we looking at only, let's say, logistics within Lagos or the whole of the country? Or are we looking at the whole of West Africa? So try to define the scope of the assignment better. And of course, this person is the best person to give you, or your person who gives the assignment is the best person to answer this. And of course, you want to then talk about how to define success, you know, much more clearly. So, okay, if in this case, you have clear metrics on how much you're reducing costs by, that's good. If not, you need to ask for exactly by how much, you know. Cutting down costs sounds like an assignment, but if you don't know exactly by how much, then you're going to spend the whole year trying to cut down costs without knowing when you are so aside from these clarifying questions, it's also good to, at some point, start to lay out your thoughts. So you can say, okay, here's how I'm thinking about going about doing this. I'm thinking that, first of all, I would like to understand, you know, where the key, the, the major bucket of expenses are with the logistics team right now. Once I have identified that, my hypothesis is that it's probably, you know, the outbound logistics that's our problem. So I want to dive into that much, you know, much more deeply and try to understand you know, ways to curb the cost there. And I'm already thinking that we could do these three things, X, Y, Z. However, the data I'm getting will, of course, guide the decisions we make. And at that point, your manager, you know, will be able to say, no, 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 no. That's not really what I was looking for. I want you to instead to focus on inbound logistics. And I think that this is the exact area that you need to spend your time, you know, doing the research. I want to understand, for example, how much we're spending on DHL versus how much we're spending on our own trucks and then see how we can manage those costs more effectively. You see, if you had waited till the entire document was put together and you came to him with a presentation that's 50 page long, it may be brilliant. It may be, you know, the best thing that has been done on outbound logistics but that's really not what he was looking for so he's just going to tear it apart in front of you and you'll feel bad and feel like you're not appreciated but you never inculcated feedback from the initial process so what you want is to always gain alignment even before you start running and when you start running you want to make sure that every few steps you take you're updating them to say look the data i'm getting is showing that for example our dhl costs are about three times the in uh, the cost we spend on our in-house trucks which would mean that we probably need to invest in getting more trucks of our own because we can cut costs by X, by X percentage. And that, you know, gives them a sense of where you're heading. What then happens at the end of the day is by the time you put together your, what, 15-page uh, proposal or what to do, then they're likely to buy into it because they feel like they co-created the idea with you. They were with you every step of the way. They were able to give feedback at every point and say, you know, look, okay, You've said that the costs for DHL are three times the in-house trucks, but have you factored that some of these trucks 
uh, we've not been, you know, for example, monitoring the diesel utilization. So maybe there are some aspects of these costs that are not captured at all. That's why it's looking much cheaper. So why not talk to this person and get that data? Or I have the data, I'll share it with you, and then I want you to build it into your model so you can understand exactly how it impacts your comparison. And so by the end of the day, you put together a presentation and everybody wows it. But really, you know, it wasn't, you weren't expecting a different answer. I could sort of, you know, um, use the analogy of a wedding proposal, right? I, I'm assuming that if you're a young man who is looking to get married, by the day you do propose to your fiancé, you are not surprised about the kind of answer she's going to give because you would have sort of managed that process to the point where you give her a ring, right? You're not going to meet a lady today and say, hey, I like you, and then hand the ring to her. You, you don't know what to expect. But if it's a lady that you have known for a while, you've met her parents, her parents have shown their approval, and you've started to talk, for example, about you know, what a married life would look like. The day you pop out a ring and hand to her, you sort of, you, you sort of have a very good idea of what to expect. Uh, it's very similar to the business world. You don't want to put together documents that people look at and they think, okay, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then the last lens is, you know, clean formatting. We'll talk about this a lot, but looking at the slide on the screen, for example, you will notice that the format I have used is to ensure, let's say that the highest level bullet points are solid dots. Uh, second level is circles that are empty. And then I, typically made sure that every bullet point does not have a full stop in front of it. So that clean formatting just makes the slide look a little better than if I was, you know, doing it all sorts of ways. Um, if you have bullet points that, you know, look different and then your fonts are messy because you, you have one font type in one area, a different font type in another area, the font sizes are clashing, it just makes for a much more messy look. So you want to ensure uniformity. You want to ensure that there's symmetry wherever it's possible. And then, you know, that you just harmonize your entire format throughout the document. We'll talk about it a little bit. All right, so what's the typical process for writing a business proposal? Um, the, the process I'm going to talk about today is, is basically described as a hypothesis-driven approach. Um, the essence of this is that you top, you sort of start the document with an upfront hypothesis, and then you use the data you generate from your research and your interviews to sort of align your thoughts to reality, right? And the reason why it's important to start with a hypothesis upfront is that it just enables you to be much more efficient. You know, um, it prioritizes your time and focus. And the idea is that you reiterate what you're doing continuously until you come to a point where you have a crisp proposal, you have a crisp, um, you know, final point that you want to reach. Um, so, so let's see how it works. Let's assume that you've been given the assignment I mentioned earlier. You've been asked to put together a proposal on how to manage costs in the um, logistics unit of one of the subsidiaries of your group. Um, and you know, you've been able to sit with your manager and you understand what the scope of the assignment is. Let's say that he believes that once you can cut down costs by 20%, he's happy. You don't need to go any further. He also believes that you know you should focus your work on rest of the country, but exclude Lagos, because he believes that Lagos um, has its own challenges and there's really not so much we can do about it now. But up country, there's a lot of room for it. So you've sort of defined the limits of your assignment much better. You have good clarity on you know, what success looks like. One of the first things you would want to do in a situation like that would be, and of course, this, this part I've described is basically identifying the issue. And identifying it means really clarifying the objective, setting the limits properly, and showing you understand you know, what success looks like. The next step would be to develop an initial hypothesis. So a couple of ways to do this. One way would be to sort of get, you know, a high level impression of what is happening in, you know, the logistics unit by interviewing some of the people in there. You know, just spend a few minutes, you've got in the assignment, you understand, you know, what you're trying to do, but maybe it's good to just have a 15 minutes chat with the head of logistics and hear him out. In that chat, he may mention things like, oh, I'm so, you know, disappointed with the way DHL is behaving. Every single time we reach out to them, they take so long to load the items and then they come back with bills that are, you know, highly overpriced. Now that sort of starts to give you a sense of what's happening, right? 
And so what you do is you take that information and use that to build an initial hypothesis. Maybe your initial hypothesis is because of the conversation you've had with um with your with the logistics manager is that DHL could be the problem, right? Um, and you've also gotten a sense of what the alternatives are. So you know, for example, that that subsidiary in question works with uh, Red Star, they work with DHL, they, they have their own trucks and, you know, other vehicles that they use for delivery. And then they are considering, you know, onboarding this new third party vendor who has given some terms of what they can do. So, so your, your thought at this point is that, hey, amongst the options we have, both the ones that I implemented and the new, the new option we're considering, that DHL appears to be the most expensive. And now, so that forms a new a initial hypothesis that you need to prove or disprove. Um, I would add here that having a hypothesis doesn't mean that you are fixed on a certain answer and that you're trying to prove that answer right. No. What you are doing is to pick an approach so that you can be effective but trying to drive an answer. Because remember, if you don't have a hypothesis, what will end up happening is you will just keep jumping around the place looking for all sorts of data and not having any concrete answer, you know? So by having a hypothesis, it means that even on day one, when your manager calls you and said, says, how's your assignment going? You'll be able to say, okay, um, so you gave me a, the assignment to cut down costs in the let's call it uh, company X um, logistics by 20%. And we decided that we'll be focusing on up country. And you'll be able to say at this point that my initial hypothesis is that DHL is the biggest problem we have. Um, and you'll be able to say that the reason why I think so is for the following reasons. Number one, um, it appears that they are sluggish with you know, picking up items from the factory. Number two, it appears that their bills are way more expensive than the others or you know, businesses we work with. And number three, it turns out that they, you know, are also preparing to, you know, hike their costs by a little bit more in the coming weeks. Now, even though you have these points, you really need to dive deeper to sort of understand the quantitative terms exactly how bad the problem is. So having the hypothesis doesn't mean that your job is done. Um, so once you've, you know, you've highlighted your hypothesis, you've aligned with your stakeholder, which is just what I've mentioned now. You know, you've gone to the manager, you've explained what your hypothesis is and how you expect to be able to prove what is proved. You know. so, so one of the things I would have mentioned there would be to say, you know, to confirm that you know, they are actually more expensive, I'm going to look at the past the costs for delivering a certain weight of package from a certain location to another between the three options that we currently have on ground. So I want to look at the cost for doing it with our own trucks for delivering items from, let's say, Lagos to Abuja. I'm going to look at the cost for doing it with DHL and with Red Star. And that, those numbers should be able to tell me by how much more expensive DHL really is over the others. Um, I'm also going to look at the timeline in terms of, you know, how quickly DHL delivers or how slowly they deliver, deliver compared to the other uh, options, the Red Star and our own trucks. Um, and the way I'll do this is I will look at um, deliveries within the past two months um, for the same distance. I would like to see how quickly they were able to deliver to the customer and then sort of tabulate this for all of the various options to try to see what the delta is between each of them. And then, you know, once you've laid out your approach, it's now easy to go out and gather data, which is now, you know, point four on our flow chart here. So you gather and analyze the information. You can easily go to the logistics manager and say, hey, you know, I'd like to see your data for, you know, deliveries between Lagos and Abuja for all these three options are in our in-house trucks, the Red Star deliveries and DHL. And he'll spool it out for you from ERP or send you an Excel sheet or even in book booklet where he records this. Your job will now be to put this all into Excel, clean up the data and prepare, you know, nice looking charts that sort of show what the difference in timing is. And this just helps you to sort of prove or disprove your hypothesis. And then here's how it works. Maybe you collect the data and the same person who complained that DHL is, you know, giving him a hard time is giving you data that shows that DHL has delivered 10% cheaper than all the other options and maybe even, you know, one day faster than the other options. That tells you that your hypothesis must change at this point, right? So that's why we have the arrow beneath that shows, you know, a reversal back to aligning with stakeholders and then, or even the actually should be extended to 
developing the initial hypothesis. Because now your hypothesis will change at this point and you'll say, hey, from the data I've gathered, it turns out that our in-house trucks are actually the big problem. Um, we seem to have spent a lot of money buying these trucks over the years, but they have become dilapidated. They are costing us a lot because we are spending a lot on servicing them, on buying diesel to fuel them, and the trucks just can't deliver on time. You know, so your hypothesis has now changed. And then maybe at this point, you will even go a step further to say, my hypothesis is that we should divest from these trucks, you know, dispose of them completely, and then invest in, you know, uh, expanding our relationship with DHL so that we can, you know, cover more locations with them and then, you know, avoid the additional cost of maintaining our trucks. And then you would want to ask yourself, how do I justify this recommendation? What kind of data do I need? And ideally, you know, you would want to look at, for example, what would it entail for DHL to cover more locations than they are doing now? Or how would you be able to structure a better SLA with DHL to say, okay, we want deliveries that will happen within 24 hours everywhere within Nigeria. How much will it cost us? And then you want to compare the additional cost to what you would have spent if you were, you know, using the in-house trucks to achieve this so that you can show management where the cost savings lie, right? So these will be some of the ways to think about this. And it's only when you've been able to come to a recommendation that you are comfortable supporting with facts and figures that you can now enter into drafting the proposal. Of course, this whole process would have required you to put together, you know, gather a lot of data, put together a lot of charts. And so all of these are, of course, raw materials to help you draft your proposal. Um, but it's also important to remember that your stakeholders must be fully aligned with what you're working on. You don't want to just jump in and keep collecting data and analyzing and keep quiet. And then last minute tell them, oh, I think this is exit. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So once you've gathered all the data, now you want to draft your proposal. And a couple of ways to do this. So ideally, synthesizing all the information you've gathered is really a very, very important aspect of the work you do when you communicate. So right now, maybe you've come to a point where you've finalized that the recommendation that actually works on the basis of the data you've analyzed is that you know, this business should dispose of all their trucks and expand their relationship with DHL and agree to you know, a much better SLA. And you have all the data to prove that number one, um, you know that uh, DHL is actually way more, way cheaper and way faster at delivery than all the others. That was data you gathered when you had your initial hypothesis that DHL was really, you know, the problem. But now it has become a supporting point under your recommendation because now it helps you prove that truly, truly DHL is a good option. And now you also have data that shows that the in-house trucks are very inefficient. You are spending a lot to you know, fuel them. You are servicing them every single week and it's costing you a lot of money, but not really delivering any value because the delivery times are way higher than DHL. And then lastly, you've now gathered data from your conversations with DHL that show that even if you expand your relationship with them, there's not going to be any additional cost because they're happy to do more business with you and their margins are protected except that their volumes would be much higher now. And, so, and however, if you had decided that you want to expand your in-house trucks to cover more locations, you would have had to buy more trucks, you would have had to spend more on fuel, and you've been able to quantify the exact volume of costs that would come in if you were using the in-house trucks. So you now you've shown that, look, there's a way to do things better. There's a way to save costs and you know, move out of this unprofitable idea of running delivery and logistics yourself. And the data is there to show it. So this is all you're going to put together in your proposal. So your summary sheet, like I said, will basically highlight you know, the high level details of what you're recommending and the um, supporting information to back up your recommendation. And then you will then move into the detailed slides where you will be presenting the supporting data in much, you know, granular, much more granular detail to support the recommendation. Of course, the final stage of you know, finalizing the proposal just means sitting down with your manager to say, look, this is what I put together. This is what I'm thinking. And of course, we've co-created this, but do you think there's any other thing I need to put in here? Maybe at this point, he will decide that there's some further analysis he's interested in. Uh, maybe, for example, he might say, look, there's this other guy who has a proposal we haven't really considered in detail. And we we'll just want you to put that into your analysis to show us Apart from DHL, you know, if we consider this new guy who we've never worked with, you know, what should we consider, what should we have, what should we be thinking about, and by how much it costs us if we decide to move to him. 
And so maybe this would be some further analysis to look at its cost, this SLA, you know, sorry, SLA actually means service level agreement. And it just means agreeing the terms with your vendor, what exactly you want, you know. Um, so that, that's really the approach you would use to put putting together a proposal. I just use this as an example, you know, one kind of assignment you, you could be given. You can apply this to practically anything. So coming back to some of the things we've mentioned, you know, you want to be concrete in what you write. Um, you want to be able to ensure that, you know, every action is clear enough and that there is no doubt what each person will do. So uh, what that means for the proposal, the example we were talking about is really that you, you want to be able to say, okay, on the basis of the recommendation we've made, we've made this is what we think should happen next. You want to be able to specify who the action owners are. So step one is that the logistics manager should call uh, you know give put out a call to dhl and ask them to come in um to sit with us so we can sign a an mou or you know some form of agreement that specifies the exact new terms of our agreement we want to have them deliver everything we ship out on the factory within 24 hours and we want them to sign these terms and agree the cost to us and all that and then of course you want to make sure that everything has clear completion dates um, you know, and, and so we have one example of what your bullet points, you know, when it comes to next steps would look like, you know. So here, yeah, maybe Emeka is the name of the logistics managers. This Emeka is, you know, okay, this example has nothing to do with logistics assignment, but you get the point. Basically, there's a timeline for when he should deliver. There's an exact, you know, assignment he must do and all that. Um, specific and concrete action items lead to a greater likelihood that the very important points. All right, so let's look a little bit at language, you know, in terms of communication. Um, there's an approach that most people favor. It, it's one that, you know, um, senior executives love. Uh, and of course, it's also one that you will find a lot with um, advisors. And that's called the answer first approach. So what that means is when you speak with senior people, you want to always start with the, the answer they are looking for before you go into any, you know, supporting information. Um, let me see if I can think of a, an example. So let's say that you walk into a lift and you are maybe a junior associate in the firm. You just got recruited, but you've been given an assignment to work on this logistics assignment. Uh, and, you know, you walk into the lift and the CEO is already there. And he says, hey, Emeka, how are you doing? Um, Here you just joined those we sent. So, um, how's the logistics assignment going? What, what's your what is the, the zero assess? It really happened. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Yes, we can. Uh, yes, yeah, we can. At what point did I disconnect? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, sir. Yes, uh, we, it was around... Uh, when you were looking for an illustration to back up answer. Okay. Um, yes. So I don't know if you guys got the example I gave of how the average person would approach that kind of communication. You stopped at um, when um, someone was supposed to 
you stopped at the point where uh, the CEO was, is there and is trying to greet someone okay. and says how how yes that's the point where it stops or where I stop caring. Okay, fine. So I'll, I'll tell you how the average person you know approaches this. Before I tell you the, the much better, the more efficient way to do this. Um, so the average person would typically say things like, "Oh, I've been given, I was given an assignment to work on, you know, supply the logistics cost. I've spoken with the logistics manager. Um, I had a meeting with him yesterday for five minutes, and then we decided that we will go talk to this person, and then we're going to collect this data and we will do this analysis." Uh, but unfortunately, what he has done is he's missed an opportunity to share insightful information to the person, you know, who manages it, or even to the CEO in this particular instance. So what you typically want to do is to use the, what's called the answer first approach, right? Um, so your CEO, you walk into the CEO at the lift or in the lift, and then he says, hey, how's your logistics pro project going? You will start by saying, um, great, the, my initial hypothesis is that DHL is our problem, and here is why. Um, number one, I, my, my initial um, thought is that they are costing us more because they bill us much higher on XYZ size of packages. Number two, um, I believe that they are spending much longer to deliver products. Um, and number three, you know, whatever reason you have. And then I expect that I'll be able to investigate this more thoroughly by generating data on our deliveries uh, timelines for the three vendors we work with or the two vendors we work with, as well as our in-house trucks. Um, and I will also be looking into the cost of delivery uh, for similar locations within the country for the three vendors. Um, and then, so in essence, what you've tried to do is to give him your initial thoughts on the project, right? Because this allows him to share his own thoughts on what you're working on. He probably has better insights on this than you do. So maybe in moment you say this, he actually comes out to say, I disagree with you, and here are my own reasons for disagreeing with you. And you will take that input, you know, very nicely because, of course, you know that your initial hypothesis was based on a small chat you had with the logistics manager. And but it allows you guys to have a much more effective conversation. And there are so many other examples you know, of how this works. Um, you could get asked, you know. Um, for example, uh, yeah, I mean, so this, this is one one example that I find, you know, so let's say, you know, you're a junior employee and you come into the CEO's office because you've been asked to, um, to get some money for a small project that your team is working on. Uh, and so, you know, the CEO is obviously a very busy person. So you walk into the office and he says, yes, what can I do for you? The average person will typically start to mumble around, you know, who sent him there and why he is there and how, you know, he will go round and round or she will go round and round. The best approach would be to say, good afternoon, so I'm here to ask for 10,000 Naira for our end of year party. Um, and then if there is need, need to specify why you are there, instead of maybe at the finance department, it's at that point you can start to provide supporting information, right? You can now say things like, um, so after you've said exactly what you want, which is the answer to his question, what can I do for you? Good afternoon, sir. I'm here to collect 10,000 naira for our end of year party. Then you will then provide any other supporting information, which will help him make his decision better. Um, so try to avoid rambling when people ask, you know, very pointed questions at you because it's an opportunity to shine. But you need to be very clear about what you want to say. You don't want to ramble. You don't want to start answering other questions that they have not asked. Maybe because you think you are actually anticipating their question, but it's wrong. Answer exactly what has been asked and then provide any other additional information you think is better. Okay, so I think I made that point very clearly. So the answers, you start with the answer and then you provide details later on. Uh, later. And then make sure you speak in sourcing language, right? Don't, I, and I find that that's probably the biggest beauty of PowerPoint. Because you don't have so much real estate on a slide, you can't type and type and type and type. You really just have to be very succinct. You put two, two words if, if that's sufficient, three words if it's sufficient. Um, you don't want to keep writing, you know, long, loose text because it just makes it more difficult for people to read what you're saying. 
you only do that when you are trying to obfuscate what you're trying to say. If you want to make it difficult for people to understand you, then you write on and on. But if you really want people to read and approve what you're, you're writing, then obviously the best approach is to, you know, write succinctly. Make sure your writing is active rather than passive. And then, of course, in terms of grammar, and I, I don't need to emphasize this too much, because I'm sure most of you would already have these at the back of your mind. You know, make sure you function properly. Make sure you use your capitalization where it's necessary. And then, of course, the one that Nigerians sort of make a lot of mistakes is would versus will. In many instances, we, we say would when we actually should be saying will. You know, I will because it's definitive. But would because I'm sort of wishing that it would happen, but it probably isn't going to happen. So make sure you check every single time you're about to say would or type would. Ask yourself, is this something I'm wishing for? Is this something I'm actually hoping to do or going to do? If it's active, if it's something I'm very clear about, then will is the right word. But if it's something I'm wish would happen, but maybe for some reason it's not going to happen, then would would probably be the more appropriate word. Um, so make sure you use succinct active language, which leaves a greater impact on the reader. Um, one second. Are you guys there? Yes, sir. Okay, awesome. Now, so what I've done here is just to outline what, you know, one of the slides from your analysis should look like. Uh, assuming that you were doing the work on, let's say, the, the logistics project, you know, um, you typically find that by the time you run your analysis in Excel, there's always going to be a lot of room to uh, present your information in, in charts. So what I've tried to do here is just to give you a sense of the kind of things you should uh, consider when you're putting together your charts, right? Um, so first of all, make sure that your unit labels are very clear. You know, Some people will write numbers without any units. You don't know if it's amounts in dollars or if this is volume in you know, kilograms or tons or something else. It, it can be a disaster when you see charts that are like that. Um, make sure that you include units wherever these numbers are. It just makes life easy for everybody. Make sure that the labels of your, uh, the axis, you know, are much very clear. It tells us what, what are you measuring on each of the axes so that we know exactly what you're doing. Um, use consistent font sizes and consistent, consistent font types so that, you know, the chart just looks neat and decent. Um, make sure that you use numbers to illustrate magnitude of the problem or the opportunity or the magnitude of change. Make sure you label correctly millions versus billions, volume versus value, percentages versus numbers, you know, different kinds of currencies. Make sure that if necessary, you're showing, you know, the growth rates so that people understand, you know, the implication of the numbers. Make sure that your decimal points are included if necessary and make sure that you don't fill your charts with excessive, you know, zeros. So assuming that you're measuring something in billions, is there really any, any need to show it to the precision of the Naira? So you are showing your sales revenue in billions of naira or billions of dollars is there any point coming to be as precise as the exact naira that was sold in that year how does that change the decision that the person is making it may make sense to just take out all that additional detail and approximate it to the nearest billion right so that whoever sees it understands that okay we had four billion in 2004 we've been able to double our sales the next year that's what the person that's what this chart should be able to convey but if you show the numbers four billion six hundred fifty-four thousand five hundred and thirty sorry four billion six hundred forty five million four hundred and you know thirty two thousand three hundred and twenty one versus eight billion three hundred and twenty five you know, million two hundred and blah 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 those additional numbers don't say much because all that matters to the decision maker is that the number has doubled. That's more than enough to help him make a decision, right? So I think these are some of the key points to mention when you prepare charts for your graphs. Just make sure these are at the back of your mind. Um, in terms of formatting, you know, be consistent with fonts, with size, with spacing, with length of your sentences, with indentation, with the kind of notes you place and the sourcing of your data. Um, and, you know, and then make sure that your page numbers are clear, make sure that there's a draft watermark if this document isn't intended to go out to the public yet. You know, these little things are really important formatting points. 
Um, and I'm sure that why most of most people end up with charts or slides that have multiple font types is because obviously they go to Google and pull out information, paste it in the chart, but forget to convert it to the font of their to the default font of their deck. And so you end up with a slide that has sometimes new Roman floating in one side, and then there's some Calibri somewhere else, and there's some Verdana in another part, and then some, you know, it, it's just a disaster. It never looks good. Um, make sure you, you're constantly error checking, right? Triple check your work. The first time you, you want to check it for maybe for content, the second time for maybe grammar, the third time, you know, or, you know, you're probably looking for formatting uh, issues. So just make sure that you learn that habit of error checking your own work. I think for me, that, that was probably one of the first things that took me a while to, to, to sort of build patience for. Because when I typed emails in those days, I would find that I finished typing the email, I sent it out, and then I reread it and realized, oh my God, maybe I should have put a comma somewhere here. Maybe a full stop would have been good here. And then I, I would realize that I knew that email wasn't ready to go up, but I was just impatient or I couldn't get myself to read it again. And then by the time I gained the patience to, read, patience to read my emails, you know, twice or three times, I found that it took me a while to learn to read it like I am not the one who drafted it so that I can actually find errors that I ordinarily would not see by myself. So it's something you must learn with practice. It doesn't come by itself. You have to read your own decks as if you didn't put it together. You have to read your own emails as if someone else drafted it and then ask yourself, cut out and put in a newspaper. Will I be happy to see this as my own writing? Right. So once you do this regularly, you learn that, that you know it, it adds a lot of value. People start to trust you more because they find that you take your time to do your work, right? So let's just make it a bit, uh, you know, lighter with some humor from Dilbert. Um, and Dilbert says, and that's my uh, blockchain proposal. Any questions? So he's done a long presentation to his boss. And then the boss says, oh, there was a part I didn't understand. And he says, okay, which part? And then the boss says the words, all of them smart contracts, certainty as a service, UTXO, blockchain, node, ledger, and dApps. So you didn't understand anything I said for the past hour. Don't try to turn this into my fault. You could have asked me to clarify. I also wanted it to end, right? So this is a really good joke. Uh, and this is why a lot of times when you communicate, you have to understand that the people that are listening to you may have a totally different incentive for listening to you. Maybe, for example, they've been paid to sit there. So it's their job to listen to you. They're not listening because they're actually excited about what you're talking about. And so they may not have the patience to actually dive into what you're talking about to help you improve the input or give you feedback that is helpful. If that's the case, you really need to understand that you must find a way to gain their trust and bring them into the presentation. Otherwise, you waste your time and their time. You keep talking and they'll keep nodding and at the end of the day they won't give you any useful feedback they will not be better off on the communication you just share with them and you know it's just the, an aura you know Dilbert feels like he the, the person listening to him his boss was unfair to him because he didn't ask questions at the right time um, but it's something that happens all the time so make sure that your communication is so crisp that whoever is listening will be able to you know, get your input, feedback or get, give you feedback very quickly. Um, so a few more general tips, right? Like I mentioned, be hypothesis driven. It's really important that while you're starting out, you know, putting together any document that you know exactly what direction you're heading, you know what kind of data you need to prove yourself right or wrong, and that you are able to then inculcate new data into refining that hypothesis. Um, get input from key people early and often. I made this very clear. Align with stakeholders early in the process. Use a collaborative process to increase their buy-in because that will ensure that by the time you come to a final presentation, they all already have bought into what you're presenting. They are not going to be looking at you and thinking, you know, what's this guy talking about? Sequence your work well because typically when you're giving an assignment, you need to be able to ask yourself, in the next three days, what data will I need? And should I ask for that data today so that it will be ready in the next three days? The last thing you want to do is to start working on a project and then discover in three days' time that you need information, but it's going to take an additional three days to generate that data. 
So before you start to run around, you know, sit down and sequence your work. I'm going to be requiring data on, you know, um, cost of delivery to Abuja. I'm going to need timelines for delivery. Who, who can I reach out to today and tell them, you know, what kind of data I need, right? And then make sure that you have clear action items and next steps that are concrete and specific. Make sure your formatting is neat by the time you come to putting together the document. Triple K, check your proposal for content or formatting errors and then allocate time for error checking. Because sometimes we do it as an afterthought, but just make sure that even in your planning and work schedule, that you actually have time dedicated for error checking. And then lastly, give people time cues. Especially when you're working within an organization, you will most likely have to come back to the same people for data later on, maybe for a different project, maybe for, you know, some other aspect of this project that will be run later on, which means that if you don't treat them nicely this time, when you come back to them later on, they will not be helpful to you. So one way to do this is before you ask them for data, tell them what you're working on. I've been asked to put together some information on this. I'm really excited to hear your inputs and your thoughts. I know that this is your, you know, core area. And I'm going to rely on you for a lot of data. And I will, and you've done your analysis and you've sort of aligned with your boss on you know, what the key takeaways are. Go and sit with these people and tell them what your proposal, you know, came up with. Uh, and ideally, I would also even prefer that you, you involve them in the process so that by the time you're presenting, they are also cheering you on because they feel like this is our work, not his work, right? Um, so update them on the outcome of your project. Of course, you can't do it with everybody. There may be very junior people who are maybe number crunchers, you know, are sort of five levels down the chain, and you may not have all the time to come and sit with them and explain your work. But at the point when you have now finalized your report, you can actually spend a little time just telling them what you were able to discover and how they were helpful to achieving this result. It's really good. It buys you goodwill for subsequent projects. It just ensures that you know they also feel like they're part of the assignment you just completed. Um, meeting management. So this is sort of an offshoot of the communication we're talking about. Um, but I felt it's important to sort of point out a few of these things because you will need them, you know, as you move into organizations or as you build your own organizations. So it's really important to talk about this. So running meetings professionally is crucial um, to ensure that those meetings are successful. So these are some of the points I felt you know, we should talk about and just highlight. Uh, number one is send out invites for your meetings. So you meet on somebody in the hallway and you say, hey, I'd like to meet with you to discuss X, Y, Z. And he says, yeah, sure, why not? Um, let's try tomorrow sometime in the afternoon. Don't keep quiet and walk into his office in the afternoon tomorrow and say, oh yeah, you know, we spoke on the, in the hallway. Obviously he has other things he's working on. So the moment you spoke with him in the hallway and he said, yeah, let's talk about this in the afternoon, send him a new Outlook invite immediately, block his calendar uh, and put it very clearly in your meeting invite meeting to discuss logistics costs of DHL. And then, you know, putting whoever else needs to be in the meeting. And if there are, if there are top items you feel you're already clear about that you would like to discuss during the meeting, you know, put them in the body of your invite so that the guy already starts to think around it or pull out files that will be useful for that meeting. If, an, if a meeting is important, send a reminder a day in advance to remind everyone that the attendance is expected. So what this means is, in many instances, the meetings you are setting up, you know, you're going to be doing this, let's say, three weeks in advance so that people are fully aligned and they have time on their calendar. But what this means, this bullet point is saying, is that a day before that meeting, you know, send a reminder, let them know that, look, I had sent an invite, but this is a reminder just to let you know that this meeting is happening tomorrow at also time. Um, prepare an agenda for your meeting, circulate it at least one day in advance, just so that everybody is aware of what exactly the meeting is going to be about and how they're going to be useful or how they're Make sure that you keep meetings of the minutes uh, and, and keep minutes of the meeting and make sure that you capture all the decisions taken and agree the actions. Um, so, okay, so there are a couple of ways to do this, right? And many organizations will have their typical templates for doing this. So what you want to do is agree with your superiors what your minute template should look like. You know, do you want to capture there are different kinds of meetings, right? If you are sitting in a board meeting for an organization, maybe for a bank, for example, it's very likely you will need to capture every single thing said. Who said what, at what time, what was everybody else's response? 
And partly because these documents become legal documents later on, you will need them as evidence to prove that so so decision that was taken was actually backed by XYZ person or proposed by XYZ person. So those kind of minutes are very different from the type of minutes you keep when this is more of an operational meeting between a couple of colleagues just to discuss some subject and come up with a few recommendations. Those kind of minutes are very brief. They typically will capture only action points and you know they will just be circulated at the end almost immediately after the meeting so that everybody has an idea of what they need to be working on. Minutes that are generated during board meetings can take maybe even a week to be circulated. So what you want to do in those kind of instances is, you know, prepare the rough points at the, during the meeting and then clean them up and, you know, I'd outline exactly what each person should do or what each person said later on. Um, all agreed actions decide on an owner and a deadline. Follow up on the agreed actions with respective owners afterwards. Um, so, yeah, your, your, your agenda should usually be circulated before the meeting. And you know the truth, while I'm saying this now, you will find by the time you either get into an organization or for those of you who already are, by the time you're running meetings, you will find that there's a strong temptation to skip some of these points, right? Some of you will want to skip, you know, sending out the agenda because it feels like, after all, everybody knows what this is about. It's a bad practice. Send out the agenda. There are a couple of reasons why it's important. Number one, it helps you to really itemize the scope of the meeting so that nobody starts to talk about the Christmas um, party when you are trying to, be, to discuss logistics uh, management, you know, for the organization. It will happen. Where there is no agenda, you will find that when someone digresses, there's no way to bring them back to topic because, you know, there's really no agenda. Um, so outline exactly what you want to talk about, prioritize them in terms of what's most important, um, and then, you know, make it clear that these are the things you need to talk about and nobody is allowed to go outside that uh, in the list of uh, core topics. Um, and of course, in many instances, you will want to, in that agenda, highlight who is responsible for what, you know, so if you are, if you, I highlighted the topics, you, you, you can easily say, look, Mr. X needs to prepare this, Mr. Y needs to present on this, and, and all of that, right? Um, so what I've just done here is to sort of highlight what uh, minutes could look like. Um, they should allow the reader to understand the discussions and the decisions taken. Um, um, and then, you know, in, in this particular instance, you know, you probably have the agent, the attendees, you have the date and location, and then you will typically have a, maybe a comment and then an action, and all of these are typically labeled. So comments would be, you know, uh, Joe presented the branding survey results highlighting the following points. So you've just summarized what the key actual key takeaways from his presentation were. And then the action that came out of that comment was that Tom is to develop a new advertising campaign to improve perception and things like that. So really, these things would all depend on the kind of meeting and all of that. But ideally, your minutes should be able to allow someone who didn't attend to take away, you know, key uh, points from the meeting. You can label the points, comments, decisions, actions, and the like. And Ideally, your minutes should go out minutes after the meeting. That's the best. So what that means is while the meeting is going on, you should have someone whose job is to take the minutes immediately. And it's a terrible thing to take minutes on a piece of paper and try to type, type them out later on. It wastes everybody's time. Use your laptop, type it immediately, and just send it out immediately after the meeting. Um, so, well, of course, you typically will have some sort of leeway depending on the organization you work for, right? Um, minutes should also include action lists, you know, indicating actions, owners, and deadlines. So what that means is at the end of the minute, depending on how detailed or how long they are, you would want to extract the action points, put the owner and the deadline so that it's just very easy. Now, here's how some of us use these action points. You could basically finish the meeting, and once you receive the minutes, you basically pull out the action items and put them into your calendar as a meeting invite for yourself. And what that means is it reminds you as you look through your calendar, maybe on the weekends as you plan for the week, to be able to say, okay, since I have an item on my calendar that shows a deadline of 31st of July, um, what that means is that I will need to prepare for it with so so and so so, you know, activities um, on Saturday or on Monday or on Tuesday. So it just helps you to plan better, right? So these action points prepared in a tabular format at the end of your mini 
tools are really good. They're very helpful because it just enables attendees to pull out the action items and create meeting invites for themselves so that they can be reminded of what deadlines they have to be uh, that arose from that meeting. Um, okay. Now, so some of the meeting behaviors that I think are really useful to talk about. You know, send upfront your agenda and, you know, any minutes from the previous meeting or even any reading items. Uh, sometimes you want to share the presentations you'll be making at the meeting ahead so that people can read them and have useful comments during the meeting. Make sure that you are on time for your meetings. This, this is how you build a professional brand. The last thing you want to be is the guy who is late for all the meetings. You know, number one, it's very insulting to senior people that you're a junior guy and you're the one that they have to welcome into the meeting. You should be the one in there welcoming everybody into the meeting. You should be the one calling them up and saying, hey, it's time for that meeting. Are you joining? And they will say, oh, thank you so much. You know, I was already just running off another meeting. So let them know I'll be five minutes late. So that just helps you build a professional brand. It lets you look like, you know, yeah, you, you really know what you're doing. Um, make sure that you appoint a chair for each meeting. So every meeting must have someone who has, a, has the authority to convene or to adjourn that, that meeting. And then who can, you know, sort of summarize takeaways from the meeting. Make sure you switch off your phone when you come into a meeting. You don't want to be distracted by phone calls or text messages. And believe me, even putting your phone on vibrate isn't good enough in many instances. If your phone vibrates and everybody knows it vibrates, it has still distracted the meeting. So silent mode, maybe, or you just switch off the phone, depending on how important the meeting is. But, you know, it's also part of how you build a brand. Everybody just knows this guy's phone will never ring in a meeting. That's how much of a professional you are. Um, listen attentively to everybody. Listen to each person's argument. And I was talking with someone very senior recently, and he, he told me that one of the first things he had to learn when he started to, you know, um, organize meetings with senior stakeholders of the financial institution he's in charge of uh, was the fact that many times in those meetings, like two minutes into the meeting, you already know exactly how you want to take what kind of decisions you want to take and you know what direction you want to take uh, in terms of you know the overall takeaway but what he learned as a leader is that, that you need to listen to people so while they may be round and round the same subject his learning was that when you organize meetings you will give everybody the opportunity to I don't know if it's just. I can't hear it. Me, but I, I can't seem to. Please let us know if it's house, so we know. Okay, so I think that Charles was actually locked out. So I'm just going to wait a bit for him to come back.
Welcome back, sir. Yeah, thanks. Can you uh, permit me to share screen again? Awesome. Um, okay. Uh, learn by listening to other perspectives. Be, build on the arguments of others. Do not reject them outrightly. Um, and make sure that you keep an open mind. Focus on the goal. So it's really about the best solution, not who contributed it. Um, let everybody finish, um, but also manage the meeting if somebody makes overly long statements, right? Um, now, this is basically what a written communication would ideally look like. Try to be concise and action oriented. Um, so make sure that the subject clearly indicates the topic and the fact that an action is required. So for example, this is relating to company X, it's a tender process and an approval is required. So the beauty of this subject line is that if Mr. Um, okay, so myself, since it's coming from John Doe, the moment I see this email, I understand it's high priority because an approval is required. I don't need, if I have 10 emails and I see one that has approval required in the subject, I know I need to read this immediately because the last thing I want is to be the guy that's holding up the production process or some activity somewhere. And then of course, you know, he has used bullet points to make it easy to read the message quickly. So it says, dear Charles, I want to give you a quick update on the TRA tender process. As discussed, we have completed the following actions. We've prepared tender documents, which is attached. We've reviewed the legal requirements. We've aligned on the bid. In order to adhere to our timeline, I need the following decision from you by 12th to 24th of April. Number one, approval of tender documents. Number two, approval of bidding price. Um, so you can see that it's very clear exactly what he needs from me. And he has used bolding, selective bolding to highlight important aspects of the message. So I can see, for example, that the three bullet points there, first three bullet points refer to completed actions and the next two bullet points refer to the decisions he needs from me. So you'll be surprised that this same very short email could be written by somebody else and it will turn into a two-page email, you know, because he wants to talk about every single thing he has done and what he has accomplished, what challenges he had. Meanwhile, the main purpose of that email may have been to ask my approval for something else, you know. So it's really important that you write succinctly and you write in an action-oriented manner so that whoever reads it knows exactly what they need to do and they can support you. All right, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. I don't know if you guys have any questions or comments. Hello, are you guys there? Yes, we have, sir. Uh, can hear you, sir. Okay. So look, I'm not expecting a lot of questions because I think it's really very common sense. It's not as uh, complicated as the topic we had last Sunday. So if you guys don't have any questions right now, you can always channel any communications or message questions you may have to Deborah, and she can reach out to me by WhatsApp and I will communicate. I, I will try to clean up both slides and share with Deborah. Um, or I don't know how you guys are doing. So maybe I'll speak with Nelson instead just to understand whether the slides are meant to go out to you guys directly or whether you're expected to sort of play back the video so that you have both content. Um, but however, they are available uh, depending on what the EMT team decides. So let me ask one more time. Do you guys have any questions at this point? None from my answer. I don't know if any other person has a question or contribution. Please go ahead. Okay, so I, I think I can take it that there are really no questions at this point. So I will stop sharing my screen. And okay. All right. I think it was Thank good. You. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. 
Okay, really have a great really weekend. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, have sir. A great week. Would I like Thanks. to give our chat? Um, I need your question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank no. you very much, sir. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, that Thank <laughs> you.